I'm uh, Dr. Rene Sanchez, and I am in, uh, I'm a theology professor, professor in theology, and I'm an assistant professor. My name is Alejandro Santana. I am an associate professor here at the University of Portland. My name is Tatara. I'm a junior here at UP, um, and I'm a philosophy and political science student. My name is Ezzin Jabbar. I'm a social work major with a sociology minor. My name is Emma Martinez, um, a senior, social work major and social justice minor. Uh, my name is Jean-Paul Mugisha. I'm a student here at the University of Portland studying electrical engineering with a math minor. My name is Efrain Venegas Ramirez. I'm a philosophy and physics double okay. major. So my name is Yuri Hernandez Osorio and I am the diversity and inclusion program coordinator here at the University of Portland. When um, we first got here to the U.S., so I'm an immigrant myself and my family, um, and so that kind of always has motivated me and driven me. And so when we got here to the U.S., I noticed as I grew older, we um, located ourselves in a very small rural town in the coast of Oregon, and we were the only um, Mexican family in the in the area for a long time. So we were really the only folks of color in that space for a really long time. And I re recall these memories of being a young kid and knowing like if we spoke Spanish in the grocery stores we would get dirty looks or just the microaggressions that my parents would receive or I would receive in school and just the di flat out discrimination that my family faced uh, growing up and so all of those impacted my life and shaped me um, as, as I grew older. And my dad is an immigrant himself um, from Mexico City and then my mom is first generation Swiss so her parents immigrated from Switzerland. Um, so growing up, the topic of immigration was kind of like a confusing thing because I saw very different experiences being lived in my family, um, like a very like white European narrative of like if you can work if you work hard and you can succeed in the U.S. and the American dream and all that. And I'm like, oh, that's okay, it's cool, yeah, for sure. Um, and then another spectrum where like I didn't really grow up with like my dad's culture. Um, because he was working all the time and so like his presence was not as close to me as like my Swiss immigrant presence and influence was um, and then it really took like getting to college and UP and getting involved with the Moreau Center um, where I went on the border immersion freshman year and we went down to the US-Mexico border and we like were in close proximity to immigration issues that um, I didn't know much about before and it was like at the age of 18 where I was like, holy shit, like I only know such a small fraction of what immigration is and what it can look like. So I like called my dad and was like, how did you come here? Because like I didn't, we had never talked about it. I, I my parents are, are braceros, which means that they work, they, we worked out in the fields. The bracero program started, I think, I want to say it started in the 30s, but uh, my father was a part of it in the 50s, and so throughout my life, my early early childhood, I guess you'd say early, yeah, uh, even into my early adolescence, we were immigrants in a sense. We worked out in the fields in Texas, El Paso, Tucson, Arizona, Nogales, that whole area, even in California, Healdsburg, all that area. We stayed, we lived in Santa Rosa, but we would go and pick apples and so forth. So some of it is just me, you know, it's my life. Uh, but. But I think as I've gotten older, for me it's about, I'm, I'm a person of faith, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm Catholic, and for me there's a very much a, like a moral imperative that's about caring for people, not just that are immigrants, but people that are weak or vulnerable, that are most likely to get um, not mistreated, unjustly mistreated. I guess what inspires me the most is the fact that I am a first generation son of immigrants. Um, both of my parents are from Mexico. Um, and when I see so much hatred and vitriol directed at immigrants, um, it affects me personally. Um, and then when I see so much misunderstanding about immigration and the experiences of immigrants in this country, um, I feel obligated to not only learn more about it, but also speak up about it. 
Um, well, my parents were immigrants, um, so I definitely come from like an immigrant background, um, and they immigrated back in the late 80s um, to pursue a higher education here in the United States. Um, and I grew up very conscious of what their story was and what the story of my family was and still is. Um, and I think that it is incredibly unfortunate that people don't fail to recognize how difficult these stories are and don't want to address them, want to pretend they don't exist, want to invalidate those stories, um, and don't want to acknowledge the challenges involved with being an immigrant or being the child of immigrants or being the grandchild of immigrants. Like, they don't want to acknowledge the complexity of that. They just want everything to be simple. And I, I don't want everything to be simple. Like, I love the complexity of being, um, of being a first generation American. And so I really was inspired to like bring those stories that were being invalidated or suppressed or hidden um, kind of to the light. The process of relocating and migrating can often be stressful and traumatic. This is emphasized in a study done by sociologists where they took a phenomenological approach to look in depth at undocumented immigrants and refugees, trauma and stress, and the way they try to cope. These traumas can surface from experiences of oppression and discrimination, or they can derive stress from their parents and or grandparents, such as stresses due to poverty, language barriers, family separation, and limited access to resources. Also, trauma can derive from situational stressors, such as an anti-immigration climate, and we see this through the removal of immigration policies such as DACA. My parents and I am an only child. Came to the United States when I was four. My parents crossed um, in the desert, the mountains in California. I guess back then it was a little easier to cross children because um, they had um, fake birth certificates that kids would use. Um, but I think one of the hardest things about that is that the parents have to course give away their child to some random people um, and hope that they see their child on the other side. Um, thankfully um, everything went well and um, I met back up with my family um, but I know they described it to me um, before um, and just how sad it is and how scary it is um, especially young children. They told me that I was crying like, a lot of course like being separated from your family not knowing why and Strangers. I was born in, in the Congo and when I was three years old my family fled and moved to Rwanda and uh, we lived in a refugee camp for 17 years. When we were fleeing Congo, uh, my, my parents, uh, we flee on feet, but my parents were, walked the border from, from Congo to Rwanda. My parents basically had, to, had no other choice but to flee Eritrea. They fled to a Sudanese refugee camp. And we we left that uh, we left that transit refugee camp because uh, uh, um, people that were chasing us from Congo came back and then raided that place and they killed uh, more than 200 people in a, in one night and so we had to flee and went back to another refugee camp where I spent uh, we spent 17 years. Basically, coming to the United States was almost as cutting off their family lineage. They really didn't have nobody else here in the U.S. But luckily enough, after a couple of years here, they found some Eritreans who were in the same boat as them. So they ended up building a small community. So now in Portland, Oregon, we have a small community of Eritrean, Eritreans uh, located in North and Northeast Portland who came here over the past 20 years. I guess for me, at a, the young age that I was, I didn't really understand too much, um, so I think the biggest challenge was just not understanding a lot of the um, reasons that I guess I was different than others. Um, just the fact that, you know, going into kindergarten, I only knew Spanish, um, and everyone else was just uh, talking in English and stuff, and so they, I didn't get, like, why there was that big difference. I, we grew up in a refugee camp. The refugee camp was, uh, uh, there was like no running water, no electricity in the refugee camp. And uh, we used to live off 24 cents a day from the refugee, uh, from the UN. That was like uh, like a meal, one meal per day. So it was, it was really hard. And uh, the, for me, I think the hardest part was that there was no education past ninth grade. So 
you they would support you to study up past uh, up to ninth grade and then past ninth grade you could you would go on your own and with 24 cents a day was impossible so that was the uh, the biggest struggle for me because i i care most about education and i feel like without education like it's hard to change this the situation that you're in i i i'm indian and so we face a kind of a different stereotype and um, one of the key kind of experiences that I really remember that I think really shaped my understanding of what it meant to be a person of color, what it meant to be the daughter of immigrants, was when I was really young. I was about eight years old, um, and in my hometown, um, my dad and I were walking through the streets of the downtown area, and we stopped behind a person in a uniform, and um, we were behind him, and he looked at us and he was telling his peer like, oh, I've been fighting in Iraq um, and I'm fighting these terrorists. And then he turns around, looks at my dad and I and says, I've been fighting people like them. And I think, and I got, I mean, I was absolutely terrified, um, but I think that was like the first time where I realized that although I very much consider myself part of like the fabric of this country, but there are people who don't. Um, and that was like a very, uh, life-changing experience for me and I was very young and I it was almost like I was somebody was reminding me that I don't belong here. In 2015 there was a study done um, exploring how immigration enforcement affects the older Latinx population about people who are about 55 plus. The research found that those who ex had experienced hardships due to U.S. immigration policies and enforcement use government resources less have a greater fear of deportation, believe Latinxes are worse off today, and have a self-reported lower quality of life. Often, when a particular immigrant group has a growing presence, discrimination and anti-immigration policies appear. With the growth of immigration from Latin America, there has been an increase in discrimination against Latinxes that has caused a negative impact on this community. When I was a little kid, I remember that we would wake up in the morning on godly hours, three, four in the morning, they, we'd go out into the fields, and in those days, the, the mayordomo, the boss man, would pick. He'd say, you know, like, you're working, you're not working, you're working. And the, he'd point at the men, usually, the fathers. Uh, and he meant the whole family. So, like, he pointed at my dad, Marcelino Sanchez. He meant all of us were working that day, right? Um, and when the, when, when the boss would pick people, you know, you knew you had a day's work, and you knew you were going to get paid, and there was going to be possibly food on the table. But, I'm going to get close, but, um, but... Um, but there were, but the men that weren't picked, or the families that weren't picked, I could, I remember that they sort of would kind of, um, they get down like the, you know, their their esteem would be destroyed. It was almost like their soul was being destroyed. They were being dehumanized. If I speak specifically to the University of Portland, the transition for folks in general is hard, regardless of your immigration status or your your, um, you know, if you're you're a first generation immigrant. Um, I think it's it's a hard environment to adapt to because it's predominantly white, and I'm speaking it's hard for folks who come from diverse backgrounds. So if, if you're anything outside of the, the norm here, which is, is white and uh, white female, um, you, you have a hard time transitioning into this is, into this institution in general. They, um, they kind of like come together, like they, we find each other. Like my parents immigrated here and they immediately found an Indian immigrant community to connect with that was like in their age group. Um, and I feel like I see that a lot in different like immigrant groups is that we kind of tend to bind together because we're so much, we're so desperate for like solidarity and we're so desperate for somebody to like understand our experiences and resonate with them. So that's one way we cope with it is we find a way to make our home more like our home. And I also, I just want to see like new people be in positions of power. Like I want to see people who are different and people who I can look at and relate to and who other students can look at and relate to. I, I'm not all powerful or all knowing and I'm always learning and always growing and so um, this is a journey that I would love students to follow me on and, and uh, engage themselves. I would challenge everybody if you hear if you hear this video or if you see this to um, to challenge yourself to to go out to those events to listen to your peers when they're talking about social justice issues that are important to them and to understand that uh, immigration is complex. We don't always have all the right answers. It's not always black and white. And so um, it's okay to sit with uncomfortableness and, um, 
and, and use your use people like me on campus as a resource to to dig a little bit further into what uh, is unsettling to you. So there's all these sort of superheroes that are running around that don't get any attention, and then you have a bomber or something like that. They're going to get a lot of attention. So I, I'm hopeful, not because I'm just naive, but because I know how. The, the real superheroes, the acts of kindness and generosity, they go unnoticed, but there's thousands of them. And just keep, keep on keeping on, you know, keep that flame going. And, uh, and if you're down, get someone to help you hold the hope for you while you, you know, and then when, you're, when they're down, you can help them. Borders are arbitrary. They were arbitrarily determined. And just because you cross from one border, you cross from one land across a border into another land, does not give anyone else the right to tell you that you don't belong in the space that you take up. Reasons for creating this video and documentary were simple. I wanted to provide voices to the human beings who are being targeted by these policies, offer their personal perspectives surrounding the issues they face, their challenges, so that we can create conversation and hopefully inspire change and justice. Um, this damaging exposure uh, creates trauma and stress among humans, um, using words such as illegal and um, different to other them. In cultural competence and diversity, I have learned that in order to repair society and change these dominant ideologies, we must spark dialogue and the best way to do that uh, was to hear from the voices that were being affected and are still being affected. And um, to simply put it, as Grace Lee Boggs said, our challenge as we enter the new millennium is to deepen the com commonalities and the bonds between these tens of millions while at the same time continuing to address the issues within our local communities by two-sided struggles that not only say no to the existing power structure but also empower our constituencies to embrace the power within each of us to create the world anew. Both of my parents were um, immigrants. My mom came here from the Philippines when she was about four and my dad came here when he was about five from Mexico. I honestly don't know a whole lot about their personal stories because they were just so young when they came here that they don't really remember a lot of how that all worked themselves. But it took me, I think, like a long time to really understand what it meant that my entire family on both sides really um, are immigrants. I never really like thought about it a whole lot. I remember just like in January or February, there were a lot of like mass raids happening around the country, um, like ICE raids, and there was a big one in LA. And I was, I remember just being in like the mailing kitchen and calling my dad and having to ask him if like there were any of our family members I needed to be like worried about because I realized that I had no idea what the immigration statuses were of like the majority of his side of the family. My dad told me which of our family members were like undocumented and I just remember like having like a meltdown in there and not really knowing like what to do with that information. But like when I hear people talking about immigrants in like a really negative way, like it hits home. And I think a really big issue is that they don't know the people that they're talking about, but like I do. And part of I think how I know them is that I've had a chance to like listen to their stories. And I kind of just like hope that being able to help immigrants and refugees share their own stories um, will help other people to kind of get to that same place that I've gotten to. So. I'm personally really passionate about the topic of immigrants and refugees. I am neither an immigrant nor am I a refugee, but I am a first generation American. My parents are immigrants from the Philippines and I grew up witnessing a lot of the struggles they face in terms of financial needs, microaggression, um, difficulty finding jobs, um, a little bit of discrimination here and there, and also receiving high expectations from their family back in their home countries. I think that one of the struggles that immigrants face is the expectation that life is easier once you get to the United States because there's this outsider perspective from a lot of developing countries where um, U.S. is this exceptional country or land of opportunities but really when you get here it's a lot harder because you find out that a lot of those opportunities aren't available for you and to add to that immigrants go through this long process to come to the United States and another process to become citizens. 
My parents came here in 1990 as contract workers. I was born in Saipan, a U.S. territory just north of Guam in 1996, and U.S. immigration law says that to be eligible for a green card, they needed sponsorship or petitioning from me as a first-generation American once I turned 21. So they waited for 27 years, basically. Um, it's difficult, you know, and not that many people know the struggles they go through and the hard work and diligence they have to pay to move forward in this new country and this is why we're telling their stories.